Well, it's a pivotal time for Justin Trudeau and the Liberals. This week, they lost an Ontario by-election in a seat that was a long-time Liberal stronghold. Some are considering this a referendum on his leadership of the party. Conservative leader Pierre Parliev has been busy positioning himself to take Trudeau's job. And yesterday, we learned a lot about Pierre Polyev, and we heard your opinions on his leadership. Today, we're turning our attention to a man who can be polarizing in this province. To say Justin Trudeau and Premier Scott Moe have a chilly relationship may be an understatement. Do you remember this from earlier this year? On the decision by the government of Saskatchewan to not pay its taxes to the federal government. As we've seen from a few different premiers, you can use the notwithstanding clause to opt out of basic charter rights of Canadians. I think it's a bad idea, but a number of people are doing it. You can opt out of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms by using the notwithstanding clause. But you can't opt out of the Federation. You can't opt out of Canada. And so coming up, we'll talk to the author of a book all about Justin Trudeau and his time as Prime Minister. And we want to hear from you, too. Is it time for Justin Trudeau to step aside as leader of the Liberals? How has his time in power affected your life here in Saskatchewan? You can call 1-800-716-2221. You can also email bluesky at cbc.ca. Well, before we dig into Justin Trudeau, let's go over go over some of the thoughts that you had about yesterday's show on Pierre Polyev. Our producer, Nicole Huck, has joined us here in studio to read some of the emails we couldn't get on yesterday's show. There were a lot. Hey, Nicole. Hey, Alicia. I'm going to start with an email from Kathy who writes, I was listening to the Front Burner podcast and they were discussing the by-election results in Toronto. The Conservative vote was around the 50,000 mark, which was noted is the level of the vote the Conservatives always pull in that area. So their analysis is that the Liberal voters didn't come out because they want a change in the Liberal leadership. They were sending a message through a by-election. The talk at the door was often that people were tired of Justin Trudeau, but were not impressed by Polyev, his persona, or his political agenda. What do I expect from a Polyev government? He's going to cut the carbon tax applied at the pump. He sure won't be cutting the carbon tax applied to the industrial users. He's going to give corporations and donors all he can. He's going to cut as many social programs and and public services, including the CBC, that he can get away with. He's been an MP for over 20 years, has never passed one bill, did try to pass one that got him censored by Elections Canada. He was 20 or 21 when he first got in. in. He's been drawing a pension for a while. During his tenure, he has voted against raising the minimum wage, voted against workers' rights, voted to slash OAS, CPP, voted against anything that I would call progress. Memes aren't going to address or fix anything. Many of our problems aren't going to go away with simple fixes. They're complex problems. Polyev is a sham, but he's probably going to become PM. Lord help us all. That comes from us, comes to us from Kathy. Okay, and then Jim writes, Polyev's motives scare me. Many of Polyev's statements are critical of what exists but does not present alternatives for Canadian problems. Housing shortage, inflation management, climate change, Indigenous segregation from mainstream Canadian employment, high percentage of incarceration, and medical services disintegration. We need the CBC as a glue holding Canada together. And Cindy emails, a federal conservative government? No thanks. Not that Trudeau has been perfect. There have been missteps. But I believe that I am still farther behind due to conservative measure, notably when we change from tax reductions to tax credits. Pierre Polyev has done nothing but be a blowhard and has shown us nothing of substance. No job experience? No thanks. Okay, and then Moreno emails, and they start with a poem. All the axed taxes have gotten new names. Four years go by till popularity sways. All good ill-gotten, foundation still rotten, and the guards that are changed are one in the same. They go on to write, I'm retired, cranky, and have been paying taxes since my first paycheck at 12 years old. There's no help coming in the form of a political party or figurehead. Playing the victim and waiting for a savior is not a plan. It's up to individuals to get things done. When one points a finger at a political party for all of one's woes, there remains four fingers pointing back at oneself. 
Pierre Polyev does not have the statesmanlike qualities to be prime minister. The Conservative Party needs a new leader with a cooler head that is not as reactive. The last straw with Pierre Polyev is when that car crashed into the bridge and exploded, and he went and claimed that we were under terrorist siege 15 minutes before the news announced it was a car accident. Polyev and his sweeping solutions would get chewed up and spit out by global economic powerhouses. Canada is in the G7 by the skin of its teeth. Everything we produce can be replaced by other countries willing to give bigger subsidies and cheaper unregulated labour. In closing, I have empathy for politicians. Making everyone happy is a thankless and impossible task. So that one's from Moreno. Nicole, thanks. I think we're going to get more emails, so you better get back on the other side, get ready you to bet. answer Ring calls. Those phones. Ring those phones. <laughs> it's going to be a busy one today. Yeah. Nicole, thanks. Thank you. That's our producer of Blue Sky, Nicole Huck. I'm Lisa Gravinsky. Today we are putting our focus on Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. And our guest for this is Stephen Marr. He's a longtime political journalist and author. His latest book is called The Prince, The Turbulent Reign of Justin Trudeau. Stephen spent a year and a half interviewing hundreds of people, including Trudeau, to get a detailed account of the highs of the Trudeau era and a sense of when and why things started to go wrong. Stephen is with us for the next hour or so. Welcome to Blue Sky, Stephen. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's great to have you. And then we also have Daniel Westlake next to me here. He teaches political science at the University of Saskatchewan. He was here yesterday for our show about Pierre Polyev, and we had so much fun, he decided to come back. Welcome back. Thank you for having me back. It's good to have you, Daniel. Um, So the question that we're putting to people today is, how has Justin Trudeau as Prime Minister affected your life here in Saskatchewan? I think it will be really interesting to hear from our listeners on this one. But like we did yesterday, Stephen, I want to start with the the big Toronto-St. Paul's by-election loss this week. What does that say to you? Well, it's a disaster for the Liberals. Uh, This is a seat that that they've held since 1993, and um, what you have to realize is that Toronto has been a fortress for the Liberal Party of Canada for many years, the biggest city in Canada, the most ridings. Every now and then, the NDP takes one in the gritty downtown heart. Every now and then, the Tories take one uh, at the suburban edge. But this is right in the heart. This is a stone's throw from the University of Toronto. Uh, it's the kind of riding where they are normally able to just count on support from the kind of, uh, you know, professional class, uh, often extremely socially progressive people. And the fact that they have lost this seat with a 25-point swing to the Conservatives with an excellent candidate and uh, uh, an unknown Conservative candidate who didn't do any media... Um, you you have to say, well, the the voters there are sending a message to Justin Trudeau, and that message is head for the exit. And um, what do you think he he should do now? Well, uh, um, it's difficult. I think he should likely take a couple weeks and reflect and then call a leadership campaign to replace him, him. But there are liberals, including liberals who are critical of him, who think that the, the party would have a hard go of it right now, trying to replace the leader at this late date. Uh, part of the, the situation the liberals face is if they have a leadership election now, it could easily be overshadowed or overwhelmed by people who hold very strong opinions about what's happening in Gaza. And those would be people on both sides of, of that very, very painful dispute. I shouldn't say dispute, war, that tragic tragedy humanitarian tragedy that's unfolding uh so and in the meantime trudeau would still be trying to run the country his would-be replacements would have to be explaining how they would be different from him so it would there's no doubt that that would not be an easy thing to do uh so i don't say that there's a an easy call one way or the other um but it seems to me i wrote something today about it where they're a bit like the edmonton oilers at the end of the third period. Are you going to pull the goalie or are you going to leave the goalie in the net? You leave the goalie in the net, you're going to lose for sure. You pull the goalie, who knows, maybe that extra skater will help you. That's the kind of situation the Liberals are Oh my, not a position you want to be in necessarily. Daniel, what do you think after listening to Stephen outline some of his thoughts? Yeah, I mean, 
The liberals, the, the, their support is so low, it's kind of hard to imagine things getting worse under a different leader. So part of me thinks, yeah, it might be a risk you take. At the same time, I think you have to look at why Justin Trudeau is unpopular. And I'm not sure those things are intrinsic to Justin Trudeau. Um, I look at this and say this is a liberal party that by the next election will be in power for about 10 years. Um, and governments tend to have a shelf life. Governments over their time in office have to make decisions that make some people mad. And if you're in government long enough, you're going to make – you're eventually going to make enough people mad that you end up losing. Um, you look at things like the housing crisis, like cost of living. All of these things are things that a new leader isn't going to fix. And so my, my concern if I'm a liberal strategist or thinking about, you know, should Trudeau leave or, or not, um, is that Trudeau leaves and you end up with somebody who is, ends up in the position that John Turner was in um, in 84 or Kim Campbell was in, in in 93 where, yeah, there was an unpopular or leader that had kind of worn out their welcome. But there wasn't really enough time to do anything to change the circumstances right. that had led them to wear out the welcome. And, and in both cases, I mean, Turner and Campbell both went down to defeat and by, by quite large margins. And does it does the leader mattered, matter to people in Saskatchewan? I think it's fair to say that a lot of people in Saskatchewan never liked Justin Trudeau uh, and also, you know, do not like the, the, the liberals. Stephen, I'm curious because... You're in a different location, and, and I know you've done interviews across the country, and right now you're speaking to a Saskatchewan audience. And so I'm wondering what your thoughts are on perceptions of Justin Trudeau in Saskatchewan. Does the leader of the party matter to, to people in this province? What do you think about that? Well, I wouldn't think it matters much to Saskatchewan. That's, that's uh, the pool of accessible voters and winnable seats for the Liberal Party in Saskatchewan is, is not large. Um, I interviewed uh, Brad Wall. Uh, for my book, and um, Mr. Wall expressed the view uh, that Justin Trudeau has been the most divisive prime minister in his memory, uh, and I'm not sure that you can entirely blame uh, Mr. Trudeau for that divide, because I think that it's very difficult for someone to balance the views of um, environmentally-minded voters in the heartland in British Columbia with people in the resource industry in Saskatchewan and Alberta. So there's a, an enormous divide of opinion over how to handle energy and the environment. Mm -hmm. And Justin Trudeau is not able to bridge that divide. And it's unlikely that a replacement would be, uh, you know, that a new liberal leader, but a new liberal leader could get rid of the carbon tax and say, uh, there's more than one way to skin a cat. We're going to keep tackling emissions, but, uh, We've decided that this is um, not working, that people don't like it. So uh, a different leader, and, and that's one of the reasons why I think it might be a good idea for the Liberals, is that Trudeau has accumulated a number of positions that probably should be changed. Uh, and a new leader would, would be able to do that in a way that, that it wouldn't be a humiliating personal back down. Hmm. What, other, like, what other what other what what other things? Which give us more examples. Maybe maybe the carbon tax is one, but what else? Well, I mean that's a, an enormous one because it's so unpopular. Um, uh, I think that someone setting a different tone um, on one of the, that a lot of Canadians find irritating about Trudeau is that he uh, often seems to have a sort of self righteous tone. Less lately, actually. But over his career in talking about diversity, inclusion, multiculturalism, in that he seems to be lecturing Canadians and saying, you know, uh, the implication being that that uh, he's setting a good example while he wore blackface uh, on several occasions. Uh, he's a feminist who sidelined the first uh, Indigenous justice minister. So he's accumulated all these things that make him appear hypocritical. Uh, and whatever each individual um, problem might, you know, there are explanations for a lot of these things. But overall, it just ends up, he, he ends up carrying so much baggage that a new leader would not. We're asking people to call in today and answer the question, how has Prime Minister Justin Trudeau affected your life here in Saskatchewan? What do you think his legacy is at, at this point? One of our guests today is Stephen Marr. 
who you're hearing from right now, longtime political journalist and author of uh, his latest book is called The Prince, The Turbulent Reign of Justin Trudeau. We also have Daniel Westlake, a political science professor from the University of Saskatchewan. Stephen, I want to know more about the title, The Prince. T- tell us the story behind that. What, 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 are you, what are you getting at with that title? Well, the story uh, is that years ago, before Trudeau went into politics, I ran into him in a, a, a pub in Ottawa and started talking to him. And uh, we were having a nice chat, and uh, I was struck by how open and friendly and interesting he was. Uh, and at one point, I mentioned his father in passing and stopped myself and said, oh, I'm talking about Trudeau, that's your dad. And he kind of got a regal look and said, I never forget I'm a Trudeau. And I thought at that time, oh, he's a sort of princely person, right? He's different from other people I've met. Um, and it sort of tracks. Uh, I later found examples when I was researching the book of his mother brother and wife calling him a prince. Hmm. And my idea is that it's a useful frame to think about him. He's not like most of the people we know. He grew up at the heart of power. Uh, He has princely confidence, princely courage, but also princely capriciousness and a princely sense of entitlement. So it's not meant to be either positive or negative, just a way of kind of framing and thinking about this Hmm. uh, person who is unlike most of the people that we know in our lives. Hmm. Which is quite different than how Pierre Polyev is trying to present himself, which was the focus of the show yesterday. If people missed it, it's available on CBC Listen. Really interesting insight to who he is as a leader. Hearing Stephen describe Justin Trudeau in that way, Daniel, I'm wondering what you're thinking about. Yeah, so uh, certainly we rarely had somebody who has the kind of lineage that Justin Trudeau has had as prime minister. Um, But political dynasties are not necessarily unusual in Canada. If you go back to the Reform Party, I mean, Preston Manning's the son of longest serving Alberta Premier, Ernest Manning. Jack Layton's father, Bob Layton, was a progressive conservative cabinet minister. You have a, a string of Lewises, David Lewis, who was um, leader of the federal NDP and his son who ended up becoming leader of the provincial NDP and, and Stephen Lewis's son, Avi Lewis, has run for office. So you do have political families in Canadian politics and this is certainly right now Justin Trudeau for obvious reasons is the, the most prominent one. Um, but I'd be careful of saying, you know, that this is an anomaly in Canada. We, we have a range in, in all political parties of these people who have kind of a lineage um, and kind of grew up with, with parents in politics and now are in politics themselves. Hmm. Stephen, when you start to think about what Justin Trudeau's legacy is at, at this point, what are some of the top things that come to mind for you? Uh, I think one of the first things he did, he campaigned on and brought in, is the Canada Child Benefit, um, which a lot of people don't really think about that because it only affects a certain uh, percentage of the population. But it's made a huge difference. It provides thousands of dollars a year to low-income parents. Uh, and uh, if you think about the, the circumstance of those people who might be living paycheck to paycheck and they're uh, in a, a difficult position when they find out that they've got a, a new family member coming along, I think that's made an enormous difference. Tens of thousands, likely hundreds of thousands of children who've had an easier childhood because of that. Um, the, uh, I spoke to Brian Mulroney about this uh, this past winter. He thought that uh, Justin Trudeau would be remembered uh, for his successful management of Donald Trump and uh, the renegotiation of our trade relationship, and also for his successful management of the pandemic. Uh, If you compare death rates in Canada and the United States, there are a lot of people alive today in Canada who would likely not be if we had pursued uh, policies like those in the United States. So those are enormous. He legalized marijuana. He uh did a, a kind of reform of the senate uh a lot of uh, um, uh smaller things I, I i think it's a a significant record uh and i, I mentioned mr Mul- mulroney at the time when mr mulroney left office uh he was widely reviled and by the time he passed away this year people with cooler heads were able to see that he had left a record of accomplishment so I think yeah. a similar reassessment is going to take place. It's interesting listening to you will remind people of some of the things that, that have 
taken shape because of, of his leadership, because of him being prime minister. Uh, and I, I want to take a moment to check in with with uh, David Shield, who's got news headlines. But then I want to come back to how things were when he was first elected. And, you know, we, we talk right now in this current moment and the vibe that we have from people very different than what it was when he was first running. So we'll get to that in a second. I'm Lisa Grabinski. You are listening to Blue Sky today. We are focusing on Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Yesterday, we did a deep dive into Conservative leader Pierre Polyev, and you shared your thoughts on his leadership. Today, we want to hear your thoughts on Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and the impact he has had on you in Saskatchewan. 1-800-716-2221. You can also email bluesky at cbc.ca. Stephen, I want to. I want you to take us back to 2015 and the the mood of the country, the sense of optimism in the country, and what was happening when when he first accomplished uh, winning that 2015 election. Well, it was. Uh, it's difficult to remember now. Now that things have have turned out the way they have, uh, but he um, was like a handsome prince striding onto the world stage. Uh, listeners may remember that when he announced his first cabinet, which was full of all these very accomplished people like uh, Jody Wilson-Raybould, and Bill Morneau, and Chrissy Freeland, uh, that he announced uh, someone, uh, he had introduced a cabinet that was gender balanced, 50% females, women. And uh, someone said, well, oh, can you explain that? Uh, and he said, because it's 2015, he got headlines all around the world positive coverage in even conservative British papers and uh, wherever he went around the world, he was got great headlines. He was in Vogue and Rolling Stone. And yeah, so and his support went up after the election. More people remembered having voted for him than did vote for him. Uh, and they they had about a year where uh, they were doing all the things that they said they would do. Um, and remained high in the polls. They had a, an astonishingly long honeymoon, which ended with uh, a, an Ill, ill-considered vacation. Yeah, okay, let's talk about that, because I'm wondering, when, when, when did the sheen start to wear off, and why? What was happening? Well, that was the, the first thing. Uh, his, uh, he went to uh, the island of the Aga Khan, uh, a, a rich uh, hereditary Muslim leader in the Bahamas, uh, he took friends and family with him, uh, and he went against the advice of his close advisors who had said that wasn't a good idea, it would look bad, and that if he was going to do it, he should explain why and be ready. Uh, so that was the sort of first inkling that we had that um, he could make mistakes. Uh, before that, he, he, he and his team looked like the smartest people to ever uh, hit the ice in Canadian politics. They, they just looked like they could do no wrong. Uh, so that was the beginning. The first thing that really dented the uh, the immaculate government of Justin Trudeau, and it was followed by other difficulties, you know, scandals and problems. Uh, most significantly, I think SNC Lavalin. Uh, but there was a, a, a terrible trip to India. You had the blackface incident. Um, Remind and- people what happened with the trip to India. So he went to India with his family, and they were there for, I think, five days. Uh, And two sort of things happened. One is they kept dressing up in Indian outfits, which goes over very well in Brampton or in, uh, you know, um, uh, Canadian cities. But the Indians started to think it was kind of weird. Mm -hmm. Um, And then uh, they had a a culture night where they invited um, a former uh, uh, terrorist, uh, and and then tried to explain it away in an awkward way. Uh, and what was going on behind the scenes there is that the the Prime Minister of India, Narendra, Narendra Modi, uh, w- seems to have uh, been trying to make things worse for, for Trudeau, who he uh, dislikes and distrusts because of the prominence of so many Sikhs in uh, Mr. Trudeau's political movement. Um, and he ought to have anticipated this and taken steps to avoid being so embarrassed repeatedly while he was over there. So it was another example of, um, you know, if you're watching it closely, you say, oh, gee, they, they really seem to have messed that up. And there's there's been, you know, a number of things like that. Uh, it's, it's wrong to look only at those things, but that's mm-hmm. part of his record. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. And and you did mention SNC Lavalin. Um, remind people about that. But my follow up question is, are people still thinking about that? Like, were they thinking about that in the by-election? And will they think about that the next time they vote? I'm just wondering about the impact of some of these things. At the time, it was it was definitely something we were talking about. But now? Well, the the way I think about it is he had a certain number of, of uh, people who had voted for him in 2015. And then as he made very various mistakes, he lo- started to lose people. And so each one of these things... Uh, he creates an impression in people's mind and they decide, well, I guess he's not so great. I'll vote for someone else next time. Uh, so whether people remember the details of SNC Lavalin or not, he lost support then that he has never regained. Um, and so a quick recap, uh, he and, and his advisors uh, did not want SNC Lavalin to have to face prosecution over uh, corruption charges related to the company's work in uh, Libya, uh, where they were paying bribes, basically, to the Gaddafi family. Um, And so they appear to have put pressure on Jody Wilson-Raybould, and she eventually left the cabinet. Uh, Jane Philpott, the very impressive former health minister, left the cabinet. He lost his clerk of the Privy Council and his right-hand man, Gerald Butts, in the fallout. Um, And uh, they looked like they didn't know what they were doing. These are very high profile things that um, will probably, yeah, they are definitely part of of Justin Trudeau's legacy. But Daniel, I'm wondering, as you hear Stephen recount some of these things, again, you are based in Saskatchewan, where in a lot of parts of the province, Trudeau is basically a dirty word. Um, People would argue that, you know, there was never a sheen to wear off. There was just no shine there and and, uh, nobody, uh, that people didn't like him from the beginning. So I'm just wondering what you think about when you think of his legacy, maybe more from a Saskatchewan perspective. Yeah, it's also worth noting in 2015, you have a real pushback against the Conservatives and Saskatchewan doesn't vote for the Liberal Party. Um, the three seats in Saskatchewan that go against the Conservatives all end up going to the NDP. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is Desnethe, or Descent, I can never say the Desne- word. Desnethe, yeah. 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 Um, Saskatoon West right. and Regina Leuven all yeah. elected NDP MPs. Which then the next election they all, went Conservative. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's remarkable to me here, even when the Conservatives were at a low point, um, Saskatchewaners de- didn't necessarily see Justin Trudeau as the, the appropriate response. I, th- I study parties and elections, and so my instinct when I look at this and the legacy of Trudeau um, is to think about where he's put the Liberal Party within the pl- Canadian political um, kind of spectrum. And, I mean, going into 2015, that party was in third place, and there was a feeling that we were going to see future elections that were conservative versus NDP races. And it was kind of unclear as to where the Liberal Party sat in that environment. Mm-hmm. And Trudeau, I think, both in 2015 and in his governing – has managed to solidify the Liberals as a kind of center-left, middle-class, progressive, kind of ironically, the kind of party that wins in Toronto St. Paul's and similar downtown ridings. Mm -hmm. Um, And, I mean, right now that looks like he's going to struggle against the Conservatives in that respect. But it's remarkable to me. There's all this kind of dislike for Trudeau, dislike for the Liberals. And in this, the NDP is nowhere. Right. The NDP hasn't seemed to picked up much of anything as a result of this. And so there's a parties and elections legacy that Trudeau has in really placing the Liberal Party as the maybe not working class center left progressive option, but at least the middle class, maybe university educated center left progressive option vis-a-vis the conservatives. And it was not at all clear before Trudeau took um, leadership of the Liberal Party, even just before 2015, that the Liberal Party was going to be able to occupy that space in Canadian politics. And I think he solidified the Liberal Party for the next coming elections as the alternative to the conservatives. And after, I mean, it sounds weird to say now, but after 2011, it was not at all clear that the Liberal Party was going to play that role. Yeah, yeah. forgot about that. Thank you for bringing all that up. Uh, and we would like to do a show on Jagmeet Singh in the days ahead, too, so stay tuned for that. We do have a caller on the line, so let's welcome Kathy in Regina to Blue Sky. Hello, Kathy. Hello. Um, interesting conversation so far, but it just seems to me that your guest is missing something that was really important just previous to what he has been pretty much emphasizing here. And if he will recall that during the 2020, uh, 2015 election, there was a strong drive toward sh- 
shifting to a first-past-the-post voting system. And the public across Canada seemed excited for that. Um, we knew that the other system, the current system that we had, was not working well, and certainly Harper did nothing to change that response. It was staid, it was dry, it was cold, and also he was quite a cold person in many ways as well, but not creative and dynamic. So here comes this younger person onto the scene that really plays to a younger and possibly more educated populace that want change and can see change possibility. And soon after he came to power and then commented that no, he would not be driving that process forward, it drove a huge amount of frustration to him personally and to that government. But they were not... Um, he was leading us down a false path where people could see opportunity for change and for growth and to make hmm. our governance system better. I want to ask, I want, uh, I want to ask even about that, but I'll let you finish your thought, Kathy. Sorry. Well, after that, then he becomes fair game for picking for other things. But also, true to case, FNC Lavala, he didn't create that out of nothing. That was there in the past already and had been let go for a long time. Things like loss of military funding over the years, long time. He just was kind of easy to be picked off because he was younger and because he was dynamic. Hmm. And so when these people are writing these things, I want them to be really fair about assessing what things are. And I also put it to you for consideration that there's a lot of how do I say, toxic masculinity going on, too. And that is males being jealous of males. And also, I suspect, an older population that do not understand some of the communication that's expected by younger populations of both male and female spectrums, uh, depending on where they work. Maybe not so much in rural, but in, in office settings across the country, it's a broader way of being. And that's not a really popular thing to ask people to look at what you're really saying and what you're really doing these days compared to where the world is moving. Yeah, interesting. Kathy, thank you. That's Kathy joining us. I think Kathy's from Regina. You can call us too, 1-800-716-2221. You can also email bluesky at cbc.ca. Stephen, do you want to jump in there? Um, reflections on on the promise for first past the post and, and what did Justin Trudeau say to you about any of that? So I, I, um, uh, I, th- I think Kathy made some excellent points there. Uh, in my book, I write about uh, in some detail about his abandoned promise for electoral reform, which I found very disappointing because I think, uh, and this is my personal view, that we'd be better off uh, with a, 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 a proportional system so that there's always a Toronto Tory and a New Democrat from Saskatchewan in the House of Commons. I don't like these big monolithic blocks. And a proportional system would allow, would make sure that a, sort of parts of the country have a little bit of variety, if you will. Uh, but that's my view. So I was disappointed when he walked away from his promise to end first past the post. And I was also, I, I took note of his excuse for it. W- w- in an interview with Marie Vastel of uh, Le Devoir, who I, some of your listeners may see, recall seeing her on uh, uh, CBC's panels at times, um, He said, well, you know, that was a a promise, but things have changed since then because people are so happy with their new prime minister, basically, uh, which seemed to me to be a a, a kind of narcissistic uh, cop-out for a broken promise. Uh, And the other point that Kathy made uh, that I think is interesting is about toxic masculinity. And I do think that there is something kind of creepy in the way some men despise Trudeau and see him as effeminate. Uh, if you, listeners may recall the boxing match uh, that where he uh, beat up Patrick Brazo, uh, and there's a University of Toronto sociologist who observed that he went in, in the course of that boxing match from being precariously masculine to sufficiently masculine, and yeah. until he's been able to sort of show that he was a real man, in a way. Uh, that there were a lot of Canadian men who uh, had misgivings about him. And that's always been part of his um, sort of difficulty with men. If you look at the polling, men uh, overwhelmingly across the country are uh, not keen on him. And women, to the extent that he has any support now, it's largely feminine. 
Wow, that is that is really interesting. Daniel, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I'm trying to jump in on both issues. The electoral reform promise was always vague and problematic. Mm. I mean, there's a bit of a minefield. Every time a province has gone through electoral reform debates, they've been divisive, and generally there hasn't been enough support to move forward changes to electoral reform. So I think they probably should have seen that one coming. Um, on, on the gender gap, I mean, this is an interesting thing we're seeing not just in Canada but around the world. Um, and it may be a product of Justin Trudeau shifting the part, like making sure the Liberal Party has a place on the left. We know there's an increasing gender gap between women tending to be more liberal, progressive, center, center left, and men being more center right and conservative. And so it's hard for me not to see that mapping on to the perceptions of Justin Trudeau and the gender gap that we're also seeing in perceptions that. Oh. Super, uh, yeah. super interesting. I could do a whole show just on that, right? I'm picturing uh, Justin Trudeau in a pink shirt and just sort of the conversations that that um, that sparked. Let's read an email here. So we got one from Francis who writes, I'm not a Trudeau supporter. With that being said, we have benefited from lost or policies that have eased our lives significantly. One is the child benefit and the disability child benefit. There have also been positive changes to grants to the registered disability savings plan for individuals who have a disability tax credit. As you can tell, we have a child with a disability and this has lessened the financial cost to provide additional care. My child, as they become an adult will have access to the new federal dental plans once they are no longer under our health plans. We have also benefited benefited for a little while the $10 a day child care. This was a major financial relief. The other continued benefit we receive is the carbon tax rebate. We receive more money back each year that allows us to retrofit our home to use less energy and natural gas. Eventually, we will replace our aging vehicle with a hybrid or electric vehicle that are becoming more available and affordable again to liberal policies. I don't recall any conservative government building any new social housing or supporting new housing on a mass scale. I'm concerned with Pierre Polyev's potential to become prime minister as we will not gain anything but lose these noted benefits. People complain about the liberal elite, but they forget that there is also a conservative elite and those are folks who no longer hold influence post Harper. Where is the government for the working class and middle class? Both liberals and conservatives seem to only benefit their own inner circle and us regular folk are the ones suffering. That comes from Francis. Yet again, a lot to dig into there, Stephen. Um, you could talk about $10 a day childcare, the impact that has had. Um, you know, Right now we've got our city council in Saskatoon voting on the accelerated housing plan. I'm going to let you pick from that email what you want to pick up on. Yeah, well, no, in the dental program and pharma yeah. care, there's, there's no doubt that the Trudeau and this is an important legacy, that he has expanded the social well, uh, safety net, the social welfare system, in a way that is making Canada more like a northern European social democracy. Uh, he, that started from the beginning with the Canada Child Benefit, but uh, he's been doing so um, on items to, to win the support of the NDP in a sort of quasi-coalition arrangement that they've had recently. Um, and when you look at the polling on all of these things, people tend to like them. Uh, and one of the reasons where I, I wonder if Trudeau, if the salesman, the presenter is not a problem, is that if you look at the, the things that are rolled out in the last budget, for example, they all seem to poll well, uh, with the possible exception of the capital gains tax increase. Um, but the party, so the policies are polling well, but the, the government's numbers aren't changing. Uh, and wh one of the things that's going to be interesting, uh, if we have a poly of government sometime next year, uh, is the extent to which he will be able to roll back things, programs that Trudeau has introduced, because that may be um, politically very difficult. And so you could have a sense in which tr part of Trudeau's legacy is a permanent expansion of the uh, uh, social welfare system. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Interesting. Okay, let's go to another caller, Britt in Regina. Hi, Britt. Welcome to Blue Sky. Hi. Thanks for having me. What are your thoughts as um, you're listening so, today? So something that I was thinking about was uh, you guys are talking a lot about, like, things Trudeau did or didn't do, but I think we have to look at uh, the larger, like, global trends and, and the 
two things that I want to talk about is like the the pipeline to the alt right that is coming out of the states and Project Twenty Twenty Five, which I encourage people to look up. Um, I think that there's a lot of young Canadians who are um, reacting to the perceived injustices of feminism and are, you know, just causing this um, extreme divide between left and right in this country. I think this is really clear uh, in seeing the studies that are showing that because housing is a problem, people are becoming more and more anti-immigrant. Um, and I think it's it's showing that we're not living our Canadian values. Or Actually, no, that's not... That's not a good way to put it, um, because we are also Canadians, but what we think of as Canadian values of being welcoming and friendly and, um, yeah, it's, that's, I think, the, the larger issue is that in times of economic downturn, um, which we are in, and a lot of people haven't recovered post-COVID, is that they think that they're going to be saved by someone who's going to lower taxes, um, and they don't see enough help coming from the Liberal Party, so... So interesting, Britt. Thanks for calling. And Daniel's like nodding his head. I know you you you, you have lots probably to say about uh, about some of the things she brought up. What do you, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think there's kind of two issues here. One one is the emergence of the far right, and I think we should be careful not to see this as a uniquely Canadian phenomena. Or the caller mentioned the the pipeline from the United States, a uniquely American phenomena. Mm -hmm. The reality is that since the early 2000s, we've seen the emergence and rise of far right parties across Western Europe. I think it's only t it's only like it, it only took time until it ended up happening in Canada and the United States and really across. Uh, um, wealthy democracies. That being said, this may be more a problem from the conservatives than it is for the liberals in the sense that I think the voters that tend to end up in those circles tend to be conservative voters. Mm -hmm. And it tends to be more a problem for Pierre Polyev to make sure he keeps those voters in his camp as opposed to voting for somebody like Maxime Bernier. Right. The other part, though, is kind of the downturn in the economy. And, and I, I think the reality of the way that kind of economic downturns and economic troubles tend to play out, is not necessarily that voters will go for lower taxes. They tend to go for the opposition. And so when the opposition is offering lower taxes, you get that effect. Um, but we kind of saw this in 2015 when the economy wasn't so great. You had a conservative party that had been in power for a while and people opted for, and it took a little time to figure out whether they wanted the liberals or the NDP, um, but they opted for one of the opposition parties. And this is, I think, just a reality of politics, again, not just in Canada, but really around across wealthy democracies, is that, that bad economies are bad for governments. Um, and regardless of what a government does about particular economic circumstances or responding to problems, they're going to get blamed for problems when they're when they've been in government for a while. Well, I'm sure you've heard it all. I mean, we've I've, we've heard I've, people come into the studio to say Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has destroyed the country, and you know, and I think we're hearing a lot of that messaging from the Conservatives. Stephen, I want to go back to you again, but I, we've got a number of callers wanting to get on, so let's go to another one. James in Saskatoon joins us right now. Hi, James. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for taking my call. Really appreciate it. Um, and, and so, yes, I am certainly one of those people who I believe is level-headed and without great passion can tell you the, and identify the reasons why Justin Trudeau has been un, unequivocally the worst prime minister we have ever had in this in this country. And I take no and I take no pleasure in, in that assertion. Right. Um, I think uh, it, there's so much to unpack about the essence of what he is. The, 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 the statement that he's a feminist, I think he's a false feminist. Uh, if I look at people like Jody Wilson-Rabel and Jane Philpott specifically, Jane Philpott, a professional woman who had great uh, academic accomplishments, had this man influence her, her direction to the point of not even being able that her, her views are valid, right? And, and you cannot deny that that experience. Now, the thing that I think, and you've had a lot of quasi-liberals kind of give the political talking points in the last little while, but let's just roll it back to a little bit of a micro situation. And we look at the result of the by-election in Toronto-St. Paul. Toronto-St. Paul are basically saying, uh, and to my my liking, but this is a complete and utter cease and desist order to the government today. Okay, it is. It is. It, it is completely against all the woke agenda. 
and all of the items because what conservatives really did want, it's not a matter of rolling back other programs. It's about empowering people so that they have jobs, they have the, their own capacity to pat, pay, run a path for themselves. And that's hmm. the, the reality. So some good points, James. We've got a few callers uh, waiting to get on. And so I, I wanna, I'm going to stop you there. Thank you for calling. Uh, and we'll move on to the next caller. So, James, thanks. And I'll say this to the three who are waiting. Um, try to keep your points tight just because we want to get as many voices on as possible. So Clem joins us right now in Saskatoon. Hi, Clem. Hi. I think Trudeau did fabulous during the COVID crisis. He invested in the right companies that researched the right vaccines. He made sure we had vaccines. He made sure we had personal protective equipment. He made sure we had rapid tests. He went on the TV daily to give us updates. And I think he did fabulous. Plus, he got rid of Harper, who I didn't like. And he gave us programs that benefit seniors and the low income. Thank you. Yeah. Clem, thanks for calling. Let's go to Ted now in Saskatoon. Hi, Ted. Hi there. Uh, Interesting conversation. I certainly don't think he's the worst prime minister we've had in our lifetime. I think that's over-the-top hyperbole. I think uh, the carbon tax has, if you you want to boil it down to a single thing, uh, the carbon tax has been very problematic because uh, it's not just that people don't understand you should treat it like a savings account. You get some money during the year, and then you decide how to spend it. So it's really a very conservative policy in terms of giving individual consumers choice. The government never really explained it that way. It was first included on your tax return when you get a carbon rebate. It should have been mailing checks out. But I think the opposition's very, very effective and just hammering uh, the point home of uh, uh, this is inflationary, uh, uh, what's the point of it? The government will respond, well, it's based on the output of, uh, of a cubic ton of greenhouse gas. That's such an abstract notion hmm. that it's difficult to get across to people. And I, I just think it was, uh, I'm, I'm in favor of a carbon tax. Uh, I think it's the best way to address this issue. But I just think it was a political loser for the government. Uh, It started here with Scott Moe, and it spread uh, to the National Conservative Movement. They've used it as a hammer just to to, to chip away at them. Thanks for calling, Ted. I want to give the last word to our our guests here. appreciate you calling. Uh, Take care, Ted. So let's, uh, we only have a couple minutes left. Um, I think my final question for you, Stephen, if you want to pick up on the concerns around the carbon tax, the messaging, but I think the overarching question that I want to get at is why do you think so many people in Saskatchewan are are so angry about that and have such strong feelings against Trudeau. I think those things are linked, right? The carbon tax and those two things are, they're just, they can't be separated. And that's what people are hung up on here in Saskatchewan. So um, in my book, I write that Polyev's uh, argument, and I would say the same thing on Moe's, on the carbon tax are kind of on border, borderline dishonest, right? For most people, uh, the carbon tax does not um, hit their pocketbook. It's shifting taxation from income to pollution, basically. So is it a messaging uh, issue, the way Ted raises, uh, brings it up? But it, yes, <laughs> but also symbolically, this another government would have done more for the resource industry. So in a sense, it's kind of true. But we needed a whole other hour. As usual, the music's playing us off, and I ask a question that really needs 30 minutes. I'd like to thank both of you for joining us today, and a big thanks to all of our callers. I'm Leisha Grabinski. You've been listening to Blue Sky.